This is my new Sile X5 CNC mill. It runs up to 20,000 RPM and comes with an automatic tool changer. As you can see, it almost fits in my tiny machine shop. My first proper project is going to be these coaxial to waveguide transitions for 10 GHz. They've got an SMA socket and a probe and a WR90 flange. The transitions are fiddly to hold, so before making them I need to machine some soft jaws. I can fit two work pieces side by side in my Girardi vise, so the transition's got two pockets. The soft jaws can hold the work pieces for two operations, drilling and thread milling the socket holes and doing the finish cuts on the flange face. I'm using 6082 aluminium and milling some reliefs and fillets so the parts will insert and remove cleanly and there won't be any binding at the corners. I run up a design in Autodesk Fusion. I've never used a CAM program or a CNC machine, so hold on to your hats while I scramble up the foothills of the learning curve. The simulation looks like it might work. I'm keeping it very simple, just a couple of end mills, a chamfer mill and an engraving bit. The wrong engraving bit, as we'll see later. My ratty old bandsaw can still cut fairly straight, but I gave myself an extra millimetre for safety. The Girardi's got pull down jaws and the stock's sitting on parallels, but I still give it a tap to make sure it's properly seated. Look, I'm nervous, right? The auto changer's motor driven. That hiss of air is just to keep the spindle taper clear. I was too mean to buy a proper automatic probe like a Renishaw, so I'm using my old faithful Hymer and probing manually until I win the lottery. My X5 has the low-cost LNC6800 controller. I nearly went for a Siemens, but the LNC is clear and intuitive. Or at least it feels like that, but how would I know? Anyway, Pro brings a doddle and I only mess up about one time in five. You may notice that slight love tap on the vertical slideway covers. Probing error, plus being an overconfident idiot, caused that. That's a 63mm end mill with only two inserts. I'm using it as a sort of wildly over-engineered fly cutter. So now I've got the stock faced off, it's time to do the engraving. This is where I made my second mistake. Absolutely terrible choice of cutter. I've got a lot better since then. So now it's time to do the top, bottom and ends. For some reason I didn't do it all as a single operation. I think I had at the back of my mind that it would take too long and it would be cutting a lot of air down the sides because there was more waste on the ends of the stock. The end result was that I've got a small burr on some of the corners. Hardly a problem though. For milling out the pockets, I decided I was going to use a fancy 6mm parabolic flute cutter and running it at quite high speeds. I was a bit nervous about pushing the cutter too hard, but I'm pretty sure I could have run it at least twice as fast and taken maybe three times the depth of cut with absolutely no problems at all. The adaptive cut I'm taking does leave a bit of extra material in the corners. Ominous foreboding, as Quinn Dunkey would say. So the next operation is a finishing cut using a contour path. It should leave a lovely smooth... Oh. Well, maybe that was just a one-off... Ah. Let's have a look at what went wrong. Those pockets have only got about three quarters of a millimetre of clearance compared with the diameter of the cutter. I could have used a smaller cutter, I could have made the pockets a bit deeper, or I could have used more compensation to slow the cutter down as it went round those corners. Luckily it's in a completely non-critical area, so I'll just chalk this one up as a learning experience.
Right, a 0.3 millimetre chamfer all around, and I think I've got away with it. Despite my attempts to wreck the part, it'll probably do. I do have a slight worry about the machining marks on the back face, but they're absolutely tiny and I doubt very much they'll make much of an impression on the back of the parts that it's holding. For the next setup I've got G55 at the bottom back centre of the part so I need to set a zero in the Y axis at the face of the rear jaw and the Z axis at the top of the step. And it's probing time again. Look, I know I'm probing on the raw face of the stock, but it's a non-critical measurement. I just need to be roughly centred. If I was doing this properly, I'd probably have used a longer end mill and machined the whole of the end faces, so then I could have a precision fit from those. I'm back to using the 12mm 3 flu end mill. This thing gets a little bit finicky if you go above about 7000 RPM, but it really can shift material. I was slightly nervous about whether the vise would hold strongly enough for taking some really, really heavy cuts, but the 3D adaptive doesn't seem to be very adaptive. Somehow it's not as adaptive as the 2D adaptive and it does a bit of air cutting and a lot of the cuts aren't very deep so I need to learn what on earth I'm doing wrong there. There's bound to be a setting, it's got to be my fault. Now the back face is done, it needs four pockets for the magnets to fit into. Why haven't you mentioned those magnets before? Oh hi Amy, it's uh, great to have you back. As Amy correctly points out, there are four magnets on the back of each of the soft jaws, held in with super glue. They help to keep the jaws in place while I'm messing about fitting and unfitting the parts. Apologies for not mentioning it previously. Right, that's the back jaw finished. Next steps to make the front jaw. It's pretty similar, except it hasn't got the pockets.
These cutters might not be mirror finished, but they're pretty good. The LNC 6800 controller is pretty much based on a Fanuc. There's a lot of similarities and compatibilities, but there are some significant differences which keep catching me out. So that's the face of the front jaw completed. Next job is to machine the back, so I'll flip it over in the vise. But before I start machining, I'm having a closer look at how the cam process has worked and exactly why it's doing so much air cutting. I haven't actually worked it out though. No idea what I'm doing wrong. Maybe I should ask Amy. Which part of RTFM do you not understand? So rude. Anyway, I made a few changes and it's a slight improvement, but I think I'm going to have to do something a bit more radical, at least for any production jobs. Time for a quick test fit before I actually glue the magnets in place. I think that looks okay. Let's flip it. Yep, I think I'm happy with that. It's gluing time. I'm using a thin cyanoacrylate glue and managing to get some of it on my fingers, obviously using two large blobs. I want each magnet to be opposite polarity to its neighbours, so I'm testing each one to make sure there's repulsion for that neighbour. I managed to get most of the glue off my fingers. These magnets are spectacularly fragile, so if you happen to let one drop onto the table, it zips across and slams into the nearest lump of metal or the other magnets and shatters into a thousand pieces. Or two and a bit pieces like this one. Because of the alternating sense of each of the magnets, if you push them within any sort of reasonable distance, they suck themselves together and it makes it very convenient for storage. Well, they fit very nicely and the magnets are pretty strong, so I think I can count this one as a win. Luckily, because I designed it using parameters within Fusion, it'll be a doddle to set it up for new sizes. I'm learning. Another quick test just to be absolutely 100% certain that everything's okay. And there we are. Huge thanks to my lovely Patreon and Coffee supporters. Links are in the description. Thanks for watching.